Thanks to uh, all of you who are here today. I really appreciate you taking the time to join our webinar, and I hope that uh, we're able to share some information today that will be of some use to you and uh, that you'll find valuable. Our topic today is to not or not to not, and we will be speaking specifically on the subject of life safety ropes and uh, the knots for use in life safety ropes. So if you're familiar with PMI webinars, perhaps you attended some of our webinars in the past where we've talked about selection, care, and maintenance of uh, vertical rescue equipment or even specific to rope. Uh, or perhaps you attended last month's webinar on heavy climbers, which had more to do with selecting a dynamic climbing rope for recreational climbing. Um, this presentation is really not going to talk about selection of rope at all. So if you're interested in those subjects, I would suggest that you go to PMIRope.com and uh, download a webinar there that is specific to that topic. Today we're going to talk specifically about uh, knotting and uh, whether or not to knot for different kinds of applications. So let's get started. First of all, uh, the question that most often comes up when we talk about knots in life safety ropes is, uh, is it okay with regulatory organizations or regulatory agencies, is it okay for me to use a knot from that perspective? And uh, that's a, a bit of a difficult question to answer with a very simple yes or no, and I'll tell you why. Compliance comes on a variety of levels. It begins on the corporate level, the company that you work for, whoever it is that you're doing work for. Uh, at the corporate level, you'll have standard operating procedures or uh, perhaps some sort of, of internal guidance for performing work using ropes. And that corporate guidance may or may not tell you whether or not you can use knots. In addition to your corporate guidance on a, um, on a company level or whoever it is that you work for, you'll also possibly have some sort of local guidance. For example, if you work for the city or for the county or perhaps you work for a local fire department, um, there may be some local guidance there that says what you can and can't do in regards to ropes. Uh, on the state level, again, we have uh, a little bit higher level of authority, and some states may indeed say that it's not okay to use knots for certain applications, uh, such as for uh, fall protection. Uh, it, some states actually do say that they prefer that you don't use knots for fall protection, but they don't say the same thing for rescue. And then on a regional level, we have uh, state, regional, and even federal OSHA, Occupational Safety and Health Organization, um, who also have regulatory requirements. So uh, those regulatory requirements may differ between that corporate, local, state, regional, and federal level, and it may differ from industry to industry. So from a com compliance perspective, um, it's not a very simple answer. You may or may not be allowed to use not, depending on what it is you're doing on a given day and who it is that you're working for on that day. When we talk about um, regulatory requirements, we do find that some regulatory requirements might actually disallow the use of some knots. For example, um, the, the present kitsch, which some of you may be familiar with, is not particularly uh, favor, found fav favorable among most regulatory organizations. So the whole concept of present knots uh, is often frowned upon, whereas other knots are sometimes allowable. There are some regulations that may actually disallow the use of all knots and say that no knot may be used for a life safety application. Other regulations may say that knots can be used only by certain personnel who are trained and qualified to do so. And then finally, um, the, the more common and modern approach is to allow knots to be used as long as they don't reduce the overall system strength below whatever specified strength is required for that system. And as an example, we talk about fall protection. Um, most fall protection systems require that the system strength be at least 5,000 pounds. So for example, some of these standards may say that it's OK to use a knot as long as the knot does not reduce the, the overall system strength below that 5,000 pounds, which means, obviously, as we're going to see in a few minutes, um, you're going to have to start off with a rope that is significantly stronger than that 5,000 pounds in order to achieve the 5,000 pounds once you take a percentage off of uh, the strength of the rope to 
to account for that not. So when we talk about what strength we're starting with, what's our, what's our baseline? Normally, life safety rope test methods uh, refer to Cordage Institute standards. There's three primary standards that are commonly referred to for, for life safety rope testing and baseline requirements. Cordage Institute uh, standards 1801, 1803, and 1805 all pertain to life safety ropes. And I should point out here that the Cordage Institute does have a significant number of other standards that are uh, really intended to address commodity ropes or other types of ropes. So when, you're, when you're looking for life safety ropes, uh, these are the standards that you should really look at for life safety ropes because they set minimum criteria or baseline requirements uh, and they require minimum breaking strengths to re be reported in a very specific and um, conservative manner. Cordage Institute standards are actually referred to by other standards writers such as ANSI or a and ASTM and SPRAT and NFPA. Now, ANSI writes fall protection standards for a variety of industry, industries. Uh, so does ASTM. The Society of Professional Rope Access Technicians is very specific to rope access. And NFPA uh, has largely to do with fire ground and urban rescue. Uh, ASTM also does have some rescue standards that refer to Portage Institute standards. So the Portage Institute standards set the baseline for the test method and for the performance requirements of the rope. And then these other standards may set some additional requirements over and above those baseline requirements. When we talk about life safety ropes, typically we're talking about current mantle rope. Now if you look at, um, at rope construction, you'll see this in some of our selection uh, webinars that we've done in the past. When you're thinking of rope construction, these kind of represent the the largest percentage of ropes that you'll see out there. The one on the left is what we refer to as a, a laid or twisted rope. Uh, the green one there, second over from the left, is a plated rope. And then the, the red one, the third one over that's red, that's a, a braided rope. That one happens to be a solid braid. And then on the, the far right, uh, that multicolored rope that you see there, that is a current mantle rope. Rope construction uh, actually plays a pretty significant role in the kinds of ropes that we choose for different applications. And these days, we find that most life safety ropes are of a current mantle construction. We talk about current mantle construction. Uh, current mantle refers to a core and sheath construction. So the current being the core and the mantle being the sheath. The current mantle construction um, is good for life safety for a number of reasons. Uh, first, it makes a, a very Personally balanced rope it, uh, tends to be uh, hard enough to resist abrasion and wear and the and still flexible enough to completely use. And most perhaps most importantly, the core fibers, you see the white fibers there that make up the core of the rope, are covered throughout uh, the length of the rope continuously. Whereas the rope we were looking at earlier, the the ropes, for example, the one on the far left here where uh, it's a laid rope or any of these other three, for example, uh, are actually made where every single fiber of the rope is exposed to the surface of, of the rope at some point in time. So all of your strength fibers uh, are potentially exposed to damage and abrasion and that kind of thing, whereas in a curve mantle rope, we see that the sheath provides a protective layer uh, for the core, so this is the, the um, primary uh, fibers that support the load, the primary strength fibers of the rope, are largely protected by that sheath. And that's one of the main reasons that current mantle has become so common for life safety. The other reason is that, relatively speaking, current mantle rope tends to create a much stronger rope uh, overall than most of these other constructions. And you can see this in this diagram here. Uh, the rope on the left is a current mantle rope, but it's a dynamic rope. And uh, it's made primarily for force absorption, so there's a much, much bigger focus on uh, a springy tendency to absorb force. Whereas the second one over, the red and white one there, that is a static current mantle life safety rope. And that's made primarily for strength 
And well, although there's a little bit of force absorption in that rope, uh, the, the primary consideration is strength. And you see the two ropes on the right are kind of the, the older style ropes or commodity style ropes uh, that are used in other industries. And all, all things being equal, an 11 mil rope, this is an example of all of these ropes being 11 millimeters in diameter, the static turnmental rope will actually create the strongest uh, type of rope for an 11 millimeter rope, and that's true for any given diameter. Um, it will generally, generally be a stronger rope if you choose a turn mantle rope. So that's one of the things that has really made turn mantle the rope of choice for life safety. Now, the downside here is that historically we're accustomed to splicing ropes in order to terminate them. And turn mantle ropes are simply not conducive to splicing. As you can see, the, the core fibers in the turn mantle rope uh, are, tend, to, tend to be fairly longitudinal. They tend to be very, very parallel. Uh, and they, they don't weave together well. And if you're at all familiar with splicing, and this is a, a very difficult picture to see it in that I'm going to show here, but um, if, you're, if you're familiar at all with splicing, you know that, that the concept is basically to weave the rope back into itself. So when you have a crane mantle rope, it's really not conducive to being woven back into itself, whereas if you have one of these uh, laid or plated or braided ropes, it's much easier to, to braid it or weave it back into itself. So the spliced rope um, is pretty much limited to one of these other kinds of ropes, and the current mantle rope really doesn't accept a splice very well. Now, we spoke a, a moment ago about minimum breaking strength of, of ropes, and when it comes to life safety ropes, we tend to talk in these kinds of minimums. The Cordage Institute sets minimum breaking strength for life safety ropes for given diameters. So for example, as you can see from the chart here, the minimum breaking strength for a seven millimeter uh, life safety rope is going to be about 2,200 pounds, whereas the minimum breaking strength for an 11 millimeter is set at 6,000 pounds, and the minimum breaking strength for a 12.5 is at 9,000 pounds. Now, realistically, most life safety rope manufacturers' ropes are actually going to be a bit higher than this. You're not actually going to have a 6,000 pound rope. You're going to have a 6,500 pound rope or, or greater. Um, but these minimum breaking strengths are determined in a very special way. Uh, the Cordage Institute specifies testing a minimum number of samples of rope. Uh, in this case, it would be five. So five samples of rope are tested. And the numbers, the breaking strengths of those ropes are recorded. And when those numbers are recorded, they then calculate the uh, standard deviation, so how far apart those breaking strengths are. So they calculate that number, and then they take uh, the standard deviation, the, 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 the mean, if you will, uh, and they subtract it from the average breaking strength of all of the samples tested. And they do that three times. So they, set, they subtract three standard deviations from the mean of the tested uh, samples. And that gives you a breaking strength that's actually a 99% a uh, or thereabouts uh, efficiency or a 99% um, reliability as to any given rope that you test on any given day will break at or greater than that strength. And that's going to become pretty important here, as we'll see in a moment. Again, remembering that those relative rope strengths are greater for the uh, static current mantle life safety ropes, which are tested in that manner, the laying and plated ropes, which are tested to uh, more commodity type rope standards, those are not tested in the same way. We don't test the, the uh, MBS, the minimum breaking strength, and calculate the three standard deviations from the mean in the same way. So that number is, is uh, calculated differently and with a much lower uh, assuredness that the, the breaking strength will be at or, or above that level. If you look at the Cordage Institute breaking strength, these are the most common sizes of ropes that are used for life safety. The one on the right. Uh, the 12.5 millimeter rope that is about a half inch diameter, if, if you can just imagine that in your head. A half inch diameter rope is typically used probably most commonly by the fire service uh, who uses the half inch rope in 
fire ground rescue and uh, heavy rescue applications. 11 millimeter diameter ropes, that's about a 7 16th rope. That rope is, is used, or 7 16th inch rope. That rope is used by uh, kind of more technical teams, teams that have uh, perhaps a little bit more tech training and, and are able to rig their systems with a little bit more understanding of what their safety factors are. Um, and it is probably the most common uh, rope for use among, for example, mountain rescue teams, cave rescue teams, and, and again, some of the, the more uh, experienced fire ground rescue type teams as well. 11 millimeter rope is also quite common among rope access technicians. Uh, and then 10 millimeter rope is sometimes used among rope access technicians, but really we see more 11 mil than anything. And the 9 millimeter rope there on the left is probably the most common in small subsystems, such as little miniature haul systems and things like that. So that will just kind of give you an idea of the relative breaking strength of life safety ropes. And I think Killian is there, by the way. Um, when we look at ropes in, in terms of knotability, uh, we, we actually test that number. We actually test to see how knotable a rope is. And the way we do that is we tie a knot, a knot in the rope, and we measure uh, under a, a certain predetermined force how well that knot snugs down under uh, a given reference tension. And so uh, the knotability of a rope determines pretty much how well that knot will stay in the rope once you tie it. The flip side of that is um, a, a rope with a greater knotability or a tighter knotability uh, will also ha tend to have a fairly soft hand. The soft-handed ropes feel good in your hands. They feel pleasant to touch. They feel pleasant to bend. They are nice to tie knots in. They're not necessarily nice to untie knots from because the knots tend to snug down very, very tight. And this becomes significant because the place that knots tend to break is in the pinch point uh, at, the, at the closest point to where the, the force is being pulled. So, so if you have a knot that snugs down or pinches down very, very tightly, uh, even given uh, the, the same diameter of rope, if it's a very flexible rope, you may get actually a little lower strength out of it than you might out of a stiffer rope. So that concept of hand is pretty important because it needs to create enough of a balance that it's a pleasant rope to work with, it's comfortable in your hand, and it's flexible enough to hold a knot very well. But at the same time, it's stiff enough or hard enough uh, to stay round under use when you put a descending device in it and when you bend it over an edge so that it doesn't uh, abrade overly, uh, over, overly badly. So having, finding the right life safety rope and finding the rope, right rope in general is really a matter of balance and which side you lean toward uh, on that scale might depend on what kind of job you're doing on a given day. In practical application, this is pretty important. Uh, for example, you can see several places in this photograph where the knots uh, are, are in the rope at various places. Um, there's, there's a rope going around bends as it goes through pulleys. There's, there's various uh, angles where things are clipped to one another. And so that, that bendability, that strength over an edge, that knotability, uh, comes into play in a number of locations throughout any given system. Again, remembering that knots are not, or that uh, curve mantle ropes are not necessarily conducive to splicing. Splicing has set sort of a, a baseline for us uh, in that historically we're accustomed to hearing that a splice will retain up to 95% of the original breaking strength of the rope. Now, this is significant because it's, it's created an expectation in our head. Uh, we, we typically say that, that a rope is about as not, is a, it, it, a rope will almost always, a splice rope will almost always break at the splice if you pull it to failure. Um, it'll break at or near the splice often, not always, I shouldn't say that. Um, but, but a splice is, is very, very efficient. Uh, if it's built correctly, if it's, if it's spliced correctly. Um, but remember, the original breaking strength 
of the sliceable rope in a given diameter starts off significantly less than that of the kern mantle. So, uh, so that's a, a point to, to take into consideration, and we're not going to really explore that very thoroughly here, but it is something to keep in the back of your head, because I want to compare that with a concept that is commonly misunderstood among um, casual rope users or non-rope users today, and that is the assumption that not to reduce the strength of a rope by 50% or more. Now, I, I've heard this uh, in trainings, I've read it in books, I've uh, seen it in publications, and, um, and, and it really forms the foundation for what we want to explore today. So if you will, this becomes our null hypothesis. Uh, we are, are trying to to prove or, disappoint, or disprove the point that knots reduce the strength of a rope by 50%. We're going to look at three different kinds of rope or knots that are commonly used in life safety rope applications. We're going to look at an end loop, which we see there on the left. That end loop is a uh, figure eight knot. We're going to look at a midline knot. The one that you're looking at there happens to be a butterfly. And then we're going to look at a knot to join two ropes. Now, it's a knot to join two ropes is technically more correctly called a bend, but I'm going to call it a knot today because really in, in uh, the way that we're looking at these, all of these are, are considered knots. And uh, so we're going to look at these three different kinds of knots in different applications. Now, of course, I work for Pigeon Mountain Industries. PMI is a manufacturer of life safety ropes. We do make our own ropes right here in the United States. And simply by virtue of that fact, anything I say is going to be uh, perceived as biased. Uh, of course, I, I manufacture life safety ropes, so therefore I'm going to say nice things about them. So for that reason, um, because the information that is produced by manufacturers uh, is, is often discounted, I'm actually not going to cite data that I've created. Instead, I'm going to cite data that was created by Dave Richard. Dave Richard is perhaps uh, one, of the most, one of the foremost uh, knowledgeable rope people in the United States today. He happens to be the technical director for the Cordage Institute. He uh, does not work for PMI, nor has he ever worked for PMI. Uh, and I really have absolutely no affiliation with Dave Richard other than uh, the fact that, that I simply respect the man dearly. So um, Dave has, has many years of, of rope experience in a variety of industries, ranging from the types of ropes that we're going to talk about today to sailing ropes to people uh, housers that, that are used in, in mooring applications. And, uh, and Dave Richard actually did a knot testing program some years ago where he solicited several manufacturers for different kinds of ropes. He took ropes from PMI, from New England Ropes, DSM, Southwest Ocean Services, Samson Rope, and Wellington. And he took all of those ropes and uh, combined them together into a knot testing program. And the question that Dave was pursuing at the time was to determine the efficiency of various common knots in relation to size, fiber, and construction. So specifically the question that he was exploring was, does the diameter of a rope, for example, affect the efficiency of a knot? Uh, so given uh, the same knot but a different diameter or size of rope, will you get different efficiency ratings? Same question for fiber, same questions for, for construction. So this was really his objective that he was looking at. And the way that he went about this was uh, he determined the, the mean breaking strength of each of the samples that he tested. He did his own testing to do that. He did not take the manufacturer's rated breaking strength, but he determined his own mean. He also determined the mean of each knot with, uh, with uh, um, I'm sorry, he determined the mean breaking strength of each knot on the different kinds of ropes. And then he calculated the percentage of uh, the knot strength versus the rope strength and looked at the standard deviation as compared with the mean. And uh, then he published his work, and he has published it in a, a variety of forums. So uh, that was kind of the, the baseline from which Dave was working. And so it's Dave's work that I'm actually going to cite today. And again, the, the, the knots that he specifically looked at, first of all, he looked at a baseline strength 
which was essentially just an end-to-end -end pull. Uh, he looked at a Bolin knot. Now, the Bolin knot that he used, uh, that he tested, is actually not the same Bolin that we use in life safety. In life safety, we typically see the high-strength Bolin used most often, uh, and the Bolin that he tested is the one that's used more often in sailing. It's the, uh, the simple Bolin that you can throw quickly. Uh, so um, anyway, just, just a point of note. He also tested the figure eight end knot, a figure eight on a bite. He tested the butterfly, which is that midline knot that I showed you a little while ago. He tested a sheet bend, and we're going to talk about the sheet bend a little bit more in a few minutes. He tested a double sheet bend, a fisherman's bend, and a double fisherman's bend. Now, um, the, the single versus the double, we tend to find that a lot of these double knots, the, the double sheet bend, the double fisherman's bend, um, these are knots that were developed in the life safety applications and in, in life safety use uh, or for life safety use largely because they're more efficient and they tend not to capsize, uh, but they actually also tend to offer a little greater strength. Now, in the tests that Dave did, I should probably mention that he performed his tests largely without safety backup knots. Uh, there were some exceptions to this, and those are highlighted in the testing, so you can see that. But it's important to notice, notice that because it's, it kind of represents a, a worst-case scenario, whereas uh, in life safety applications, the backup knot, usually consisting of, of uh, a hitch, a half hitch, an overhand, uh, those are considered kind of standard among life safety users. Dave also did some testing on different kinds of ropes. He tested on polypropylene ropes and, again, on some, some laid and braided ropes that, again, we're not really going to explore today because those, uh, those are, aren't really the, the focus of our study today. We're really going to focus on ropes that are used for life safety applications. Uh, that said, there, several of the knots that I, I mentioned there earlier that, that Dave tested are knots that are not commonly used in life safety applications. He wasn't just doing this project for life safety purposes. He was doing it for uh, a broader purpose. So I'm going to include that data here just for reference. But then we're going to isolate out the most common life safety knots and look at those later in the presentation and highlight them specifically. And again, I should state um, that, that this the, the whole test series was performed by a person who uh, really is highly skilled and very familiar largely with sailing ropes um, and is probably more experienced in splicing than in tying some of the knots that he tied, although he's a very good knot tire as well. Um, but he has, I guess I'm just trying to say he has a lot of depth in ropes. So uh, that is something that is worth mentioning and is worth considering. Now, the first set of data that we're going to look at is data that Dave created for the 12.5 millimeter static rope. Now, 12.5 millimeter, as you might uh, remember from a previous slide, 12.5 millimeter is about equivalent to half inch. And so what Dave did first is he did a, test, a series of tests just to determine the breaking strength of the rope. And you can see in the first left-hand column there, where it says uh, break strength, or BRK period, STR period. That column represents those five tests where he did the breaking strength test. And um, this is just kind of a, a random pull from his uh, uh, data. So, um, so these are the five tests that, that were in that particular test series for that particular rope, whatever it was. Um, then he took the same rope, the same spool of rope, and he tested a series of five bolins, a series of five figure eights uh, uh, on the end of the rope, and then a series of figure eights on a bite, then a series of five butterflies, then a series of five sheet bands. Now, again, here I should mention the sheet band, um, as you'll see from, uh, from the, the note, um, in this case, the sheet bend didn't pull out, but the double sheet bend, which is highlighted there in pink, um, the double sheet bend did tend to pull out unless he put a backup knot on the on the back side of the the the, uh, the bite there. So um, so Dave did put in a uh, an overhand there to uh, 
to back that knot up, and that's how he achieves those breaks. Again, that would be standard practice in a life safety application. Life safety application. Um, the fish knot that he refers to there, um, that would actually be a fisherman's knot, or what we refer to in the life safety world as a fisherman's knot. There's just not enough room to, to write fisherman in there, so, uh, so it just says fish knot. But you can see the fisherman's knot also had a tendency to slip unless there were uh, safety knots on the sides of that. And, uh, and so he did tie half hitches on both sides of that fisherman's knot to do the testing. Whereas in the double fisherman's, he did not have to back up that, uh, those, that knot. He just tested it uh, straight, just a straight knot. So you can see that the data there uh, is, is fairly, um, fairly rep representative of, of what you might expect for most of those kinds of ropes, um, and, or most of those kinds of knots, I mean. So this is the, the full series of all the various knots, and, um, and it's on the 12.5 millimeter static rope. Now, Dave also did the same kinds of testing on dynamic rope. Dynamic rope is different from static rope in uh, the way that it's made. It tends to have a little bit softer hand. It tends to uh, have a, a little bit more flexible feel, a little bit thinner sheath. And um, as we look at our percentages a little later on, we'll see that our percentage of strength lost was actually a little greater in the dynamic series, um, not appreciably, not not hugely so, but consistently so. So enough to warrant further testing for sure. Again, on the 10.5 millimeter dynamic, you'll see on the left-hand column, they did a series of tests to determine what the breaking strength was going to be. He figured out what the um, the standard deviation was between those, and uh, and then he he tested the bowlin the figure eight at the end of the rope, the figure eight on a bite, a butterfly sheet bend, fisherman's knot, double sheet bend, and a double fisherman's knot. Again, on the sheet bend with the 10.5 millimeter dynamic, he did have to um, tie an overhand knot, uh, or actually he did two half hitches on this one, in order to um, to safety off that sheet bend, which is interesting because in the previous data we noticed that it was the double sheet bend that slipped, not the sheet bend. And in this case, it's the, the single sheet bend that slips. And, um, and it probably has to do with the bendability or the hand or the softness of this rope. So uh, the sheet bend should, should obviously always be used with some sort of a, a safety knot. So you can see all of the data there for the 10.5 millimeter dynamic ropes. And again, you jumped all the way down to 7 millimeter accessory cord. 7 millimeter accessory cord uh, tends to be not quite as soft as a dynamic rope. Um, he did see the, the slippage in both the sheet bend and in the double sheet bend. Uh, so he did safety off those knots as well in order to get those to um, to, to break at a, an acceptable rate. So this is the data for the 7 millimeter accessory cord. And you can see uh, that we got percentages that are roughly equivalent, maybe a little bit better than some of the, the dynamic climbing rope percentages, um, maybe fairly equivalent to some of the tests that we did on the 12.5 the millimeter uh, life safety rope. So let's look at those ropes just a little bit more specific, specifically uh, and compare specifically the knots, the different types of knots with the different types of, of ropes. Now, if you look at this series of tests, or, uh, this is actually the same data that you saw before, just arranged a little bit differently. This data um, shows the retained strength for the figure eight knot on life safety ropes. These blue representing the 7 millimeter accessory cord, uh, the red representing the 10.5 millimeter dynamic rope, and the green representing the 12.5 millimeter static rope. And again, keep in mind um, that the figure eight knot is a very commonly used knot. It's probably the most commonly used knot, I would suggest, in life safety applications. It's used to terminate the end of the rope. It's used as a retrace to tie into a rope. Uh, it's used for a a lot of different kinds of things. And we see that the percentage of strength lost is um, somewhere between 20 and 25 and 30% um, in, in that range there. So 
he, we, we retained somewhere uh, upwards of 70% regardless of what kind of rope we were using. But notice there that the, the least retention is in that 10.5 millimeter dynamic rope. Now, I want to say when we talk about efficiency of, of a knot, we are talking about the retained strength. We're not talking about the lost strength. So when we say that, for example, a knot is 69.9 and let's say 70% efficient, that means that it has retained 70% of its strength in that knot, which means that it has lost 30% of its strength. So in this case, we're looking at the figure eight knot on my safety ropes. And as a worst case scenario, we've lost about 30% of our strength and just over um, just over 20%, maybe 25% uh, at the best case scenario in these series of tests. That's the figure eight knot. So let's go on to look at some of the other kinds of knots that we use in life safety. The butterfly knot, which is um, a knot that is often used in the center of the rope. It's used to make a, a bite or a loop in the middle of the rope. Uh, and the way that it, it comes out, it actually makes it uh, conducive to pull the rope in multiple directions. You can pull it end to end, and you can also pull from that bite, uh, and you get pretty good results regardless of which way you pull it from. So the efficiency for the butter and butterfly knot on, on the life safety ropes that Dave tested, uh, in the 7 millimeter accessory cord, we saw about a 72% retained strength. In the 10.5 millimeter dynamic rope, we saw about a 70.8% retained strength. And in the 12.5 millimeter life safety rope, that's the static rope, we saw about an 80.6% retained strength. Now, keeping in mind that, that green column, the 12.5 uh, the millimeter static rope, that's probably the stiffest rope uh, in this in this series. So you might be getting a little bit higher results just because of the stiffness of that rope. Of course, uh, this 7 millimeter proves me wrong here. The difference between 78 and 81 isn't really all that significant. Um, but again, we do see the 10.5 millimeter dynamic rope on the fisherman's, the double fisherman's knot, uh, as being the lowest breaking strength. Again, probably because that 10.5 millimeter dynamic rope is the softest of all of those ropes. So the double fisherman's knot is the one that we see here that is joining the two ropes. It's joining the white rope to the orange rope. And, um, and we're seeing somewhere upwards of 20-25% um, strength retained uh, in, in this knot as well. And then finally, I included this only because uh, it was really the closest that I could come to the, the misinformation that we so often hear about the 50% strength loss. Um, the sheet bend, or the double sheet bend in this case, uh, is a knot that is really used only in very special circumstances. The name double sheet bend, or sheet bend in general, comes from sailing terminology, the sheet referring to the sail. And it's the knot that the sailors would use to tie a piece of rope to a corner of the sail so that they might read on it or haul on it for some reason. So uh, you can imagine when you grab a, a hunk of sail and wad it up, it's going to be very, very thick. And the rope that you're trying to tie it to isn't necessarily going to be as thick. And so um, combining those two, it requires a very special kind of knot in order for the knot to hold. And so that's where the double sheet bend comes into play. And that double sheet bend um, is, is um, seeing somewhere between, in this case, somewhere between 54.6 and 50% retained strength, depending on which rope that we're looking at here. Again, I included it only because it represented kind of the, the worst results that I could come up with for anything that might plausibly be used in some sort of life safety application. But again, it's typically used with very dissimilar sized ropes to accomplish a very specific purpose. So let's look at a summary of uh, basically what we've just found out about retained strength or efficiencies for the various knots in the life safety ropes. Um, 
when, as we, as we said, when we talk about efficiency, we talk about retained strength. So we really haven't talked much about the uh, strength loss. So, so I want to talk in terms of the loss at this point. Um, and I, just for, for uh, discussion purposes, I basically took the lowest number in all of the test series. So the lowest number among these three different kinds of ropes uh, for the figure eight on a bite, we saw a loss of 30.1% uh, of the strength of the rope. So worst case scenario on that figure eight was, was with the 10.5 millimeter dynamic, and, uh, and we did see a 30.1% a loss. The butterfly, we saw a 29.2% loss. Again, worst case scenario being with the, the dynamic rope. Uh, the double fisherman's knot uh, was, was a little more efficient. And we saw a retained strength of, of a little bit higher in, in most cases. But our strength, our worst case strength loss in that test series was 10, uh, with the 10.5 millimeter dynamic and we saw a strength loss of 26.6%. And then the double sheet bend again, representing our worst case scenario, but even that didn't hit our 50% strength loss that is so often assumed to be true. We actually lost 45.4% in the worst case scenario, and in this case it was actually the 12.5 millimeter rope um, that saw the worst case scenario there. It was not the 10.5, so uh, although they're, they're all pretty, pretty close in that series. So, uh, interestingly, this is uh, representative of, of, again, Dave Richards' data, but it's consistent with, I think, what we see with other data as well. I want to talk about that in relation to sewn terminations. And I'm going to talk about sewn terminations today more than I talk about swages. And the reason for that is swage terminations uh, were for a while used and, and still are to some degree used in life safety rope applications. but because of the variability in the swaging process, uh, we can't necessarily get the repeatability that we want out of the swage. Uh, swages are really designed for cable. They're designed for a different purpose. We can make our own uh, swaging dies so that we can uh, compress the, the, uh, the, the swage onto the rope at a, a predetermined uh, rate and, and dimension. Uh, and we can get pretty good results out of them. But there's some disadvantages with the swage, not the least of which is the fact that um, you have a big old honking heavy piece of metal on the end of your rope uh, when you're trying to use it. So we've really moved largely towards sewn terminations. And so the tests that I'm going to show you on sewn terminations uh, are not tests that Dave Richard did because we didn't have uh, sewn terminations in his test series. That wasn't really the purpose of his testing. This is actually all from testing that was done by uh, Chuck um, Weber at PMI, excuse me. And Chuck Weber is the production director at PMI. He's in charge of, of manufacturing all the PMI ropes and, and anything that's, that's really related to rope at PMI. So Chuck has a great deal of experience. In addition to being a climber himself and a, an avid rope user himself, uh, so he's very personally interested in the performance of the rope. He is in charge of all of the, the manufacturing and production production and of things at PMI. And so um, so he has a, a very vested interest in knowing how things perform. So he from his from his engineering perspective uh, looked at our sewn terminations to determine what the efficiencies might be of a sewn termination. So I'm going to show you a few series of Chuck's testing. Again, these are just kind of representative samples. For example, here we see 12.5 millimeter PMI Classic. This is a sewn termination. Um, the rope minimum breaking strength, the breaking strength of that rope is actually 9,442 pounds. So that's the, the minimum breaking strength that's rated on that, that rope. Um, the mean breaking strength of the terminations that he tested in this series was 9,220. Uh, standard deviation between those breaks is a little over 216 pounds, almost 217 pounds. So taking three standard deviations and subtracting that from the mean, uh, we come up with a breaking strength of 8,570. So you'll find that the rating on the breaking strength of PMI 12.5 millimeter classic rope 
the, the zone terminations on those, uh, the ra our rated braking strength on that is 8,570 pounds, which is about 9% under the minimum braking strength rated on that rope of 9,442 pounds. So that's for 12.5 millimeter rope. We move along to 11 millimeter PMI Classic rope and the sewn terminations uh, on that uh, 11 millimeter Classic uh, PMI Classic rope. That breaking strength on that rope is 6,744 pounds. Now again, that's the mean calculated minimum breaking strength. Uh, if you were to take a bunch of samples and test them in your backyard, you'd probably find that, that they're uh, a little stronger than that. Uh, and in fact, in termination, the, the, you'll see there that the mean breaking strength of the terminations that he tested were actually, it was actually 6,830 pounds, which is higher than what the minimum rated breaking strength is of that rope. So that's why I wanted you to understand how we calculate that minimum breaking strength, um, because the, the uh, breaking strength of that termination can otherwise be a little bit confusing. Um, very consistent results in this test, test series. The standard deviation is just over 135 pounds. Uh, taking three times 135 pounds, we end up with just over 405 pounds. So uh, the minimum breaking strength of that termination is rated at 6,425 pounds. So that's about 5% less than the minimum breaking strength or the minimum rated breaking strength on that rope. And then looking at 10 millimeter PMI Classic, the stone terminations, um, we find a very similar result. The minimum breaking strength on the R10 millimeter rope is 6,070 pounds. Uh, the mean breaking strength of the terminations in this series of tests was 5,790 pounds. And taking three standard deviations from that mean, uh, we come up with a minimum breaking strength uh, rated on that termination of 5,516 pounds, or again, about 9% less than the minimum rated breaking strength of the rope. So we can see that the minimum rated breaking strength of the sewn terminations is, at least as far as our sewn terminations at PMI are concerned, um, we have fairly consistent numbers. Now, this is testing of our product only, and um, I really can't I really can't speak to other zone terminations. So I just want to throw a caveat in here that there is some amount of variability in the construction of the zone terminations. So depending on how the rope is made, how the zone termination is sewn, um, you can get some, some pretty variable results there. Some of the manufacturers' minimum rating, rated breaking strength on the terminations may be uh, upwards of, of 20%. So don't take that 10% as gospel, but instead, Ask for manufacturer's data whenever you purchase a sewn termination from a manufacturer. The, the good news is, is that as we develop um, different ways of terminating and different ways of recording, the standards are kind of keeping in, keeping in touch with that and they're keeping up with that. And in fact, now I believe that uh, the 2012 edition of the NFPA um, uh, Life Safety Rope an equipment standard is going to specify that if a manufacturer offers a terminated rope, that he must tell the the purchaser what the rated breaking strength is of that termination, not just of the rope. And that um, that's that's something that's going to be coming into, I believe, all of the standards, the ASTM standards, the Cordage Institute standards. I think we're going to start seeing that more and more uh, as we as we gain familiarity with new unique ways of terminating ropes. So to let you compare um, the different kinds of terminations that we've looked at today, and I'm only going to do this for the 12.5 millimeter static because uh, I'm, I'm really not uh, an Excel expert and, and I really am not all that adept at making charts. So I only made one, um, but you can go back to this data and actually make all your own charts to your, your heart's content because all the data is in here. Um, but for the 12.5 millimeter static, just as an example, um, if you consider the, the breaking strength of the rope, we obviously that's 100%. We get 100% breaking strength um, out of the 12.5 the, the millimeter static. When we test a figure eight on a bite, we get about a 77.5% efficiency. 
Uh, testing a butterfly, we get just over 80% efficiency. The double fisherman's knot is almost there at about 78% efficiency. And then the sewn termination, at least as far as CMI is concerned, the sewn termination is at more like 91%. So uh, which of these knots is OK for you to use, or which of these terminations is OK for you to use in a given application? Is it OK to use a figure eight? Is it OK to use a butterfly? Should you go for a sewn termination before you go for uh, one of these other knots? really depends on a lot of factors. And, and it's really not a question that we can answer for you uh, without being in the field, but it hopefully this will give you some data to work with. I also want to throw in another caveat here. Um, and, and that is that the testing that we've shown today really was only on uh, nylon life safety rope. It really was not on any of the uh, high modulus polyethylenes or the uh, Kevlars or, or other types of materials that are out there. And as you may have seen, again, in, in other webinars that we've done, you'll have noted that we see some different kinds of results out of these very high strength, high modulus ropes. Uh, we see that repeated bending abuse in these ropes actually does them a lot more harm or can do them a lot more harm uh, than we see with standard nylon or nylon polyester type ropes. So, um, so again, these numbers that we've talked about today really only apply to the nylon life safety ropes that, uh, that are cited in the classic and some of the other ropes that, uh, that Dave tested, which again were all, uh, were all nylon and nylon polyester. So is it okay to not or is it not okay to not? Uh, we've given you a lot of information today, and, and hopefully we've answered some questions. But there's a lot of factors that go into the answer of whether to not or not to not. The first, of course, is regulatory considerations. Who's writing the rules that you have to live by, and what rules have they written? So that would be the first thing that I would suggest taking into consideration. Secondly, who's tying your knots, and how well are they trained? Are they trained to tie that type of knot? Um, and does your does your training specify that um, the, the person who ties the knot can't be the person who double checks the knot? And, and I would highly recommend that that, that field practice uh, is a, an important consideration in determining whether or not to use a knot and which knots to use. We've looked at rope types and the, the knot strength as compared with the rope types. And so um, knowing what type of rope that you're using, and what kinds of efficiencies to expect out of those different knots in those different kinds of ropes is a key factor in deciding what's OK and what's not OK based on your desired system strength, or more specifically, your desired system safety factor. So taking all of those things into consideration, um, it basically boils down to the answer, as with most things, depends. It depends on what your desired safety factor is and what equipment you're using and how well your people are trained to get there. Now, I know that we haven't necessarily answered all of your questions very thoroughly today, but hopefully we've given you enough data to be able to answer some of your own questions. But perhaps more importantly, we've given you some data so that you can ask some more questions. Asking questions is incredibly important, and taking stuff out in your backyard and throwing it off your roof or off the nearest bridge um, can be incredibly enlightening. And I would encourage you to uh, just pick, pick up your ropes and, and, and take those, those old weights off your weight bench and, and do some testing yourself and see what kinds of numbers you come up with uh, and what kinds of results that you might get and do those really uh, compare, how do those compare with some of the data that you're seeing published. I want to turn things back over to Jess now. And um, I would encourage you to, if you have any questions, to certainly let us know. And we will, uh, we will try to get back to you with those questions just as soon as possible. So Jess, thanks. Um, can everybody hear me? Um, Okay, I am going to just switch my screen now. 
Um, if you have any questions, please go ahead and type them in the chat slash questions area of your control panel. And um, we do have a couple of questions so far, so go ahead and type them in and we'll get to them as we can. And um, Louis, uh, the first question is, do you recommend leaving knots tied in store ro stored ropes and does this harm them? That's a really good question and, uh, and I'm sorry I didn't cover that during during the webinar. Um, the, the issue of, uh, of leaving rope or leaving knots tied in the end of the rope uh, is only an issue insofar as the bending is concerned. If you put a knot in the same exact point at, uh, on a rope all the time, the, the bend point or the pinch point of that knot is always going to be at the same point along that rope. So if you can distribute that over time, you're a whole lot better off. So um, leaving the knot tied in the rope is not nearly as big a problem as using it the next time in the same exact spot. So I would certainly highly encourage you to, um, to move the location of that knot, even if it's just a couple of inches here or there, um, to, to distribute the bending point of that rope over time. Now, I haven't done uh, any real definitive testing on that, and, and I think that um, it certainly warrants testing, but I can tell you just from anecdotal experience that, that when, when you leave that knot in the rope, if you use it time after time in the same spot, the rope kind of gets floppy at the neck, and that floppiness kind of indicates to me that there, there may be an issue there and that we may not want to encourage that. Okay. Uh, the next question is, uh, can a rescuer realistically attain a 15 to 1 safety margin with a knot tied in an 11 millimeter rope? And how about a half inch rope as well? Oh, I'm going to say, whoever, whoever sent that question, I want to send him a cookie. Um, actually, I'd, I'd love to do a, a whole webinar on safety factors. I think it would be a, a really fun topic because um, the 15 to 1 safety factor that we assume that we get um, is really a misnomer. The 15 to 1 actually comes from the minimum braking strength that's assigned by the, the NFPA to the given diameter of rope that they recommend using for, uh, for a given weight or a given load, uh, so the, the difference between the load and the rope strength. They don't take into consideration the system safety factor at all. Um, so nor, even if we're starting with components that are 15 to 1, um, by the time we bend it over an edge, much, much less uh, tie a knot in it, you know, anything we do with it is going to reduce the strength to some degree and it's going to affect our safety factor. So that's an excellent question that um, uh, really kind of we could spend all day answering, but the, the bottom line is no. <laughs> okay. Um, and that is all the questions we have right now. I'm going to go ahead and start wrapping this up. If you have any more last minute that you want to get in right now, um, you can go ahead and type them in while I'm doing this. And um, you can visit the website shown on your screen to ask Louie further questions. Um, there will be a button there to email her. You can also download the slides from this presentation or watch the live recording of this webinar. All of that will be available within 24 hours at that link. And the PMI webinar series hosts webinars frequently, so keep an eye on our website for dates and topics. Uh, we try to do them about once a month, so kind of keep that in mind when you're planning your schedule. And for news and updates, including when we're doing all of our webinars, you can sign up for PMI's eNews and also follow us on Twitter and Facebook. And uh, we still don't have any other questions, so if you have any others, you can feel free to email Louie using the button on our website. And we really appreciate you being here, and we hope that you enjoyed it. And thank you, Louis, for doing this. Thanks, Jess. Thanks, y'all, for being here. All right. Have a great day, everybody.